good evening and a warm welcome to this webinar. We are MedGenome, the leaders in genetic testing in India, and we are organizing this webinar in association with our partner, Natera, a leading genetic testing and diagnostics company based out of California, USA. Natera has developed and commercialized the Panorama uh, non-invasive prenatal test. In addition to this, they also offer a host of other proprietary genetic testing services genetic testing services. The topic for today's webinar is the science and significance behind fetal fraction measurement in NIPT. And our speaker for this evening is Dr. Samantha Leonard, who is the International Medical Director at Natera. So Dr. Leonard is a trained geneticist and has worked extensively in clinical genetics through her career. She has vast experience in prenatal counseling and interpreting genetic test results. She was also involved in a European project focused on disease-specific use of next-generation sequencing technology when she was at INSERM Toulouse. So before I hand over to Dr. Leonard, I wanted to inform the audience that if you have any questions or comments, you can type them out in the Q&A or chat window of the Zoom conferencing browser. We will also be sending a recording of this webinar in case you miss out any points or would like to revisit some points. So look out for this sometime next week. And in addition to uh, Dr. Leonard, we also have Dr. Priya Kadam, who is the medical, who is the director of the NIPT program at MedGenome. And she will address any questions regarding India specific aspects of NIPT at the end of the session. So without any further delay, I will now transfer the host to Dr. Leonard, who will then take this webinar forward. Hello, and thank you very much for listening to this webinar today on the science and significance behind fetal fraction measurement in NIPT. The topics that we're going to cover today are what is fetal fraction? Why is it so important? How can we measure it? What kind of things can affect fetal fraction? We're going to look briefly at fetal fraction in twins and then finally consider the future and whether fetal fraction is something that could be a potential biomarker for other aspects of pregnancy. So we'll start just by remembering that what NIPT is measuring is cell-free DNA. And this cell-free DNA is free-floating fragments of DNA outside of the cells in the mother's circulation. And these fragments come both from the mother herself, um, from the white blood cells, from the adipocytes, but also from the placenta. So when we talk about um, fetal fraction, um, I guess really we're talking about placental fraction, but we commonly refer to it as fetal fraction. But it's important to remember that it is actually placental in origin. And so fetal fraction is the proportion of all of that cell-free DNA that you have floating around in the mother's circulation that you look at in your blood sample, the, frag the portion of the cell-free fragments that come from the fetus. And during the time that we do NIPT, this fetal fraction on average is between 10 and 12% but it can vary by gestational age and other factors. And we'll discuss some of those later. So if we look at this chart, we can see that really for quite a while during pregnancy, the fetal fraction remains very stable. It's important to remember that this is the average fetal fraction. So if we look here around 10 to 12 weeks when NIPT is often performed, it is around that 10 to 12% mark. But for any individual woman, the fetal fraction can vary from day to day. And we can see that at early gestational age, there's actually higher variance in fetal fraction. So this chart is showing us the percentage of cases with low and intermediate fetal fraction. So we see over here at nine weeks, the percentage of cases under 8% fetal fraction is around 45%. The percentage below 6% is around 25%, and just under 10% of cases, you actually have a fetal fraction of under 4%. And then this varies um, as gestational age progresses. This study by Hudikova et al. said that a key determinant of the reliability of aneuploidy NIPT is the fetal DNA fraction in maternal plasma. 
and this committee opinion by the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine in the US said that the fetal fraction or the amount of cell free DNA in the maternal blood that is of fetal origin is essential for accurate test results. And they commented that some laboratories require a fetal fraction of at least 4% for a reportable result. Other laboratories, however, do not measure or report the fetal fraction. So let's look at why it is so important by looking at two examples. So example one is a study that's now become um, quite well known, where samples from two non-pregnant women were sent out to five commercial NIPT providers um, without actually telling the NIPT providers that the women were not actually pregnant. So it was a, a form of test. And this study was uh, published in Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology. And the author was Takudi Zetel in 2015. So you see here, these were the five laboratories. And the first two of these laboratories did not return a test result on aneuploides, stating that there was insufficient fetal selfie DNA for accurate evaluation. And that's what you would hope that a report would say, given that the women were not actually pregnant. And then down here, you see that three laboratories actually did report out on a result. And they said that this was a normal female fetus, so normal result. So what we can learn from this, um, we saw that two laboratories, and these actually used a SNP-based fetal fraction measurement, correctly reported the insufficient fetal DNA. And three had provided results consistent with normal female. And so, of course, because there wasn't a fetus there, what they were actually measuring was the maternal cell-free DNA. And they weren't able to realize that that is what they were doing. So fetal fraction matters. And we see that one laboratory actually did measure fetal fraction and reported fetal fractions of 4.3% and 3.9%. And so in this case, the method that they were using turned out to not be so accurate, and it's not a method that's um, much used anymore. The other two laboratories were not measuring fetal fraction. And so the authors said that the measurement of fetal cell-free DNA is a basic quality metric required to ensure reliable interpretation of test results. In this second example, this is a case study of a 35-year-old lady in her first pregnancy. And the nuchal translucency had been noted to be increased at um, 11 plus weeks gestational age. She had a first trimester screening result, which showed high risk for trisomy 21 and trisomy 18 and 13. And this was followed up by an NIPT test, which returned a result of no aneuploidy detected. And this was a laboratory that was not analyzing fetal fraction. Because the ultrasound scan then went on to be abnormal, she had an amniocentesis, and this actually showed a result of 47XY and trisomy 21. And when the laboratory did go back and look at the fetal fraction retrospectively, they saw that it was very low at 1.7%. And this level of fetal fraction would often be considered by laboratories to be too low to give a reliable result using NIPT. So this study by Kanik et al. said that the most common factor associated with the few observed false negative results with NIPT is low fetal fraction. So let's look at how it affects NIPT performance. And in order to do that, I just need to um, remind everyone of the two major approaches to NIPT so that it'll make sense when we look at how fetal fraction affects these. So there's two basic forms of method. There's the SNP method. And in the SNP method, SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. And what this approach does is looks for these points in the genome where we expect to see differences from one person to the other in many situations. And so these, these differences, these single letter variations from one person to another, don't have health implications particularly, but they allow us to tell the difference between one person's DNA and another person's DNA. And so this can be used to look at these variations on the chromosomes that we're interested in, to see if there are two copies or three copies of the chromosome. 
The other approach is a counting approach. And what this does is it looks at all of the cell-free fragments that come from a chromosome of interest. So in this case, chromosome 21. And it looks at these just on the basis of whether they come from chromosome 21, not whether they're maternal or fetal. It can't distinguish between those. And then it looks at all of the fragments, the cell-free DNA fragments that come from a reference chromosome. So in this example, chromosome three. And they would normally expect to see a certain ratio between the fragments that belong to chromosome 21 and the fragments that belong to chromosome three. And this ratio would be something like 20% to 80% from chromosome three because chromosome three is much bigger. And so if that is what is observed, then that would be given a normal result. However, if there was extra material from chromosome 21, then compared to chromosome three, then this would be given a high risk result. And so if we think about it, that extra material from the fetus, the fetus already has a relatively small contribution in the whole pool of cell-free DNA in the sample. And you're looking at that extra little amount that comes from that one extra copy of chromosome 21. And so if we have a reasonable fetal fraction of 15%, then that extra copy of chromosome 21 is contributing enough material for it to be relatively easy to see a difference between the situation in which the fetus is disomic or normal. And in this chart, the blue area represents the maternal contribution. So you can see, of course, that mum is contributing most of the cell free DNA fragments. And then these colored portions at the top just show you the fetal contribution. So if there's enough fetal DNA, then that extra contribution coming from chromosome 21 can be relatively easy to spot. However, as the fetal contribution goes down, that extra little bit that's coming from the chromosome 21, of course, diminishes as well. And so when you get down to below 4%, you can see here that really there's very little difference. And those colors are just to illustrate in reality, because there's no difference made between maternal and fetal fragments, at these low levels of fetal DNA, it's very, very difficult to spot differences. With the SNP-based approach, it's looking, as we said, at differences in those single letter changes. And this is a SNP plot. And all you need to be able to look at from this plot are these columns here, one column for each chromosome. So this column represents chromosome 13. This one represents chromosome 18 and 21. And what is being looked for are these three bands. So in a disomic or normally chromosome fetus, you see three green bands. And you can see here, even with the naked eye, that there's a difference. And chromosome 13 has lost that middle band here. And at this fetal fraction, which is a good fetal fraction, you can see that even with the naked eye. But as the fetal fraction decreases, so that data gets messier, and it is more difficult to distinguish between disomy and trisomy. So how can you measure fetal fraction? There's a number of different approaches. So you can look at the chromosome Y markers, you can look at methylation or fragment length or SNPs are some of the methods that you can use. And we'll look at each of these in turn. So we'll start with Y specific markers. So here, what is being looked for are specific markers that show you that the Y chromosome is present and how much of the Y chromosome is present. So this is a very, accurate way of looking at fetal fraction, because the mother doesn't have a Y chromosome, you know that all of that Y chromosome material that you are seeing must come from the fetus. So it's an excellent method, but of course it only works for male fetuses. And so really that's only useful 50% of the time. The methylation approach makes use of the fact that um, in certain regions of the genome, fetal selfie DNA can be differently methylated from maternal DNA. So that's the attachment of methyl groups. Um, and so if you use that phenomenon that there's more often um, methylation on fetal DNA than, un than methylation in maternal DNA in certain regions, you can then exploit that by using methylation sensitive enzymes to digest the maternal portion. And then everything you've got left is fetal and you can measure that. So this, um, this, of course, 
depends on how much of the uh, fetal DNA is actually methylated or unmethylated. And it isn't a perfect way of distinguishing between the two different types. With fragment size, um, the idea here is that the selfie DNA fragments, which come from the fetus, have a tendency to be shorter than the selfie DNA fragments, which are maternal in origin. And so you can see um, the difference here. So this blue line is the fetal line and this red line or pink line is the maternal line. And you can see that there is a slight difference in the average fragment length. So again, here you're exploiting this um, tendency to be a slightly different size in length um, to estimate how much of your sample contains fetal fragments. Using the SNP method, if you remember back to the picture that we showed earlier on of the different letters, um, you're looking for areas where the fetus has inherited a different um, nucleotide from the mother. And you can see that at many of these regions here, the fetal and maternal nucleotides are the same. But this is one of the points that we can use where there's a difference between the fetal component and the maternal component. And so you can use this to accurately measure the fetal fraction and see how much is coming from the fetus as opposed to the portion that's coming from the mother. And this study by Kim et al looked at some of these different me measurements. And so it compared, for example, the fragment length method against the Y-based method. And if there was a perfect correlation, then this number up here, R would be one. And you see that it's not bad. So it's only looking at male fragments because of course the Y-based method can't be used for the female fragments. But you see that there's pretty good correlation. Um, this method over here, which was a SNP-based method using just 62 SNPs, um, actually fared very slightly better. So there's a correlation of 0.938 between the SNP-based method and the Y-based method. And there's a correlation of 0.932 between the fragment-based method length-based method and the Y-based method. So what kind of factors can alter the fetal fraction? So we know that fetal fraction can be lower if the gestational age is lower. It can also be lower when the maternal BMI is higher. And the theory is that this is a dilutional effect. So it's not that the fetus is actually releasing less selfie DNA, but rather the selfie DNA that's coming from the mother is increased. And so it has a dilutional effect. There are certain maternal conditions which are known to be associated with lower fetal fraction. Um, for example, um, high blood pressure or being um, on blood thinning medication, heparins, specimen collection issues. So we know that the use of butterfly needles and tubing to collect blood um, can decrease the fetal fraction. And this is thought to be due to the smaller fetal fragments sticking preferentially to the tubing compared to the slightly larger maternal fragments. And then certain aneuploides um, like trisomy 13 and 18 and also triploidy can be associated with a lower fetal fraction. So is there anything that you can do to improve the fetal fraction? Um, firstly, and um, probably most importantly, is to ensure that all instructions regarding the sampling process for your individual test are followed. Um, and in particular, no butterfly needles should be used and the sample should be stored and transported correctly following the instructions. It's important to be aware of the gestational age requirement for the test that's being used and to be aware of factors that may decrease the fetal fraction, such as the increased maternal weight. What can we do with cases where the fetal fraction result comes back as um, the test can't be performed because of low fetal fraction? We know that studies have shown an increased risk of aneuploidy in this group. And a recent study by Ravello et al. demonstrated that this was the case for trisomy 13 and 18, um, but not really for trisomy 21. And that data suggested that this no core group is at increased risk. And so recommendations have been made that diagnostic testing and or repeat CFDNA should be strongly considered for this group of patients. 
I want to talk now about twins and fetal fraction. Um, so fetal fraction may be 30 to 35 to 40% higher in twin pregnancies compared to singletons. So overall, you can get a higher fetal fraction. However, it's been noted that the fetal fraction per twin is lower and that the individual contribution could differ as much as twofold. So if you're measuring the overall fetal fraction for a twin pregnancy, and you have a fetal fraction of 8%, you don't know for sure that that represents 4% from one twin and 4% from the other. We talked earlier about how important it is that the fetal fraction should be above the threshold for the specific test that's being used. And so if you have a, an NIPT that is able to measure the individual fetal fractions for each twin in dizygotic twin pregnancies, then um, you're able to know that you have enough fetal fraction from each twin to get the accurate or the most accurate possible result. And finally, I just want to consider the future and whether it's possible to get more information out of fetal fraction. So we've talked about how important it is to look at fetal fraction and consider it and have a certain amount in order to look at aneuploidy testing. But if you have a threshold, that means that some samples will not get a result because the fetal fraction is too low and it may be necessary to repeat the test. But some of that group are going to be at increased risk of aneuploidy. So is it possible to determine which of that low fetal fraction group might be at increased risk and which of that low fetal fraction group, is it just a case of or is it likely to be just a case of normal variation? Um, so there has been an algorithm developed, um, which is, has been developed for use with the Panorama test. And this algorithm um, has been developed to help differentiate between low fetal fraction that's likely to, or more likely to be due to the trisomy 13, 18 and triploidy, and the group where it's more likely to be just normal variation. And this algorithm incorporates maternal age and gestation and weight. And it looks at those factors to see whether the fetal fraction that's been measured is, looks like it's within the normal possible range for that particular situation, or whether given that context, it actually looks abnormally low. And that gives a positive predictive value for trisomy 13, 18 and triploidy of one in 17. Um, it's also been observed that within this group, um, there's an increased risk of fetal loss. So in the group that um, receive the higher risk result with this particular, what we call an FFBR approach, um, a fetal fraction based risk approach, um, those that receive a higher risk, so of those low fetal fraction groups, they've been divided into the higher risk section. Um, they seem to be at increased risk of fetal loss. So although this isn't something that's, um, that's currently available everywhere, I think it's something that uh, for the future may help to provide information to help clinicians to make decisions about these particular groups and how to manage them. So I have some take home messages regarding fetal fraction. Firstly, that as we said, fetal fraction is the proportion of fetal DNA that's present um, in a cell free DNA sample from maternal serum. So the part that comes from the fetus as opposed to from the mother. It can be measured in a variety of ways and these ways have varying accuracy. A number of factors can influence the fetal fraction, um, including the maternal weight and the gestational age and some chromosomal anomalies. And this is important to bear in mind. At low fetal fraction, it becomes more difficult to give accurate aneuploidy results. And not measuring fetal fraction means that you cannot be sure that you're actually assessing fetal DNA, as we saw from the Takudi study with the non-pregnant women. So thank you very much for listening to the webinar today, and we'll now take some questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Leonard, for that insightful talk on the importance of fetal fraction. I uh, now invite the audience to uh, you know, uh, send across their questions and comments through the, uh, please use the Q&A and chat windows that are there in the Zoom conferencing browser.
Um, so you can type out your questions in the, that uh, section and I will address it to Dr. Leonard. Uh, in the meantime, we have received a couple of uh, initial questions through our registration process, which I will now address to Dr. Leonard and then uh, Dr. Priya. Uh, so firstly, uh, Dr. Swapnil from uh, Nagpur asks, uh, how much should be the ideal fetal fraction? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Um, so fetal fraction, as we said, um, we would on average expect during the time that we're doing NIPT um, to be around 10 to 12%. Um, we can do NIPT with less fetal fraction than that, and each test will have its own particular threshold. So some tests require a fetal fraction of 4% or above. Um, the panorama test requires a fetal fraction of 2.8% or above. So each test will have been validated to a specific fetal fraction if they're using that um, in their measurements. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Deepak from Bangalore would like to know, how do you consider fetal fraction when haploblocks are identified in the specimen? Okay, thank you. So, um, with, um, with the, the panorama approach, um, it uses over 13,000 SNPs. So, actually, if there are haploblocks, we still have plenty of SNPs um, that are going to be informative, that are going to allow for the measurement of fetal fraction. As we saw from the slides, um, the, there was a study that showed that even using 62 SNPs, um, it's possible to get an excellent measurement of fetal fraction. So really haploblocks um, aren't an issue for fetal fraction measurement. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Dr. Nanubai and Dr. Tuteja would like to know, uh, if, could you provide more information on twins, uh, particularly the utility of uh, NIPT SNP based methods in twins and egg donors? Yeah, so, um, so NIPT certainly can be used for twins and um, more recently the SNP based method is also available for twins um, and it's using this approach, um, what's interesting about it is it's because you're looking for differences in different DNA profiles, it's possible to also tell the difference between monozygotic and dizygotic twins, um, so to have that extra information and also to measure um, individual fetal fractions, which as I mentioned is, um, is very helpful to be sure that you have enough fetal fraction um, from each twin in the dizygotic twin pregnancies to give a result. Um, it is also available for egg donors and surrogate pregnancies, um, but with reference to the SNP-based method, what's important to be aware of is that currently it's possible to assess three DNA profiles. And so you can think of that as um, a mother with two babies, so a mother with twins, um, or what is effectively two mothers and one baby. So if you have a surrogate pregnancy, for example, um, if the, the surrogate has received an egg from the, the mother, you have the uh, egg donor and you have the surrogate and then you have the pregnancy. So that's your three DNA profiles. Um, and similarly with egg donors generally, you have the egg donor, you have the mother, and then you have the fetus. So at the moment with the SNP-based method, it isn't possible to do egg donors and surrogates with twins. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ritu from Trishul would like you to address false negativity in NIPT. Right. So um, it's really important, of course, to be aware that NIPT is a screening test. And um, I mentioned at the beginning that NIPT is looking at um, placental material. And placental material generally reflects what's going on in the fetus. But there are some times when there can be differences between um, what's happening in the placenta and what's happening in the fetus. And so um, for that reason, even with the most perfect NIPT, um, it's possible to have these false positives and false negative results. Now, one of the things that we can do, so we can't, we can't alter that fact of biology, but one thing that we can do is ensure that we have enough fetal DNA present to get the most accurate result as we can. And in order to do that, um, as we saw, it's helpful to measure the fetal fraction accurately and to be able to be assured that you have enough contribution to be able to look at um, the fetal proportion. Okay. 
Dr. Lakshmi from Coimbatore would like to know how accurate is an IPT results compared to amnio or FBS? Okay, so um, as I was saying with the, the previous answer, um, NIPT is a screening test um, and it is not intended to replace amniocentesis or fetal blood sampling. Those are diagnostic tests, of course. And so um, NIPT is a very good test, but it's a screening test. And for, um, for the reason that I mentioned with the placenta, you're looking at placental material. Um, now, one thing that sometimes people ask is, um, is about chorionic villus sampling, which is also looking at the placenta. Um, NIPT looks at one of the cell lines from the placenta, the cytotrophoblast, whereas um, chorionic villus sampling, if you're doing a direct and a culture, you're actually looking at two different cell lines. So the issue of mosaicism that's confined to the placenta in other words, a difference between um, the chromosomal makeup of the placenta and the chromosomal makeup of the fetus, um, you've got a higher chance of discovering that with chorionic villus sampling. Um, so that method is considered diagnostic. NIPT is a screening test. And if you get a high risk result with NIPT, um, then it's important to do a confirmatory diagnostic test to be sure that what you're seeing in the NIPT is reflected in the fetus. And if you get a negative result on NIPT, it's important to always bear in mind that um, occasionally you could get a difference between um, the fetus and the NIPT results. So your ultrasound scan is also a very important part of the picture. And of course, NIPT looks at particular uh, looks for particular chromosome anomalies um, and the baby could potentially have other genetic abnormalities or other structural abnormalities that the test isn't designed to look for. It's also important to remember that amniocentesis um, will, it depends on what test you ask for. So for example, if you do an amniocentesis and you just do a carrier type, then that may not pick up certain microdeletions that you might actually pick up um, doing NIPT. If you do pick up microdeletions doing NIPT, it's important to try and do um, a more detailed type of test when you do your amniocentesis that will be able to look for those microdeletions. Um, so a chromosomal microarray or a FISH test, for example. Uh, so we have a couple of questions from the live audience here. Uh, so Dr. Mala would like to know in demise of a single twin in twin gestation, how accurate is NIPT? Okay, thank you. So um, in cases of, of vanishing twin or demise for twin, um, then NIPT is not recommended. Um, it's not validated for those particular circumstances. And at the moment, um, NIPT gives you a risk for the whole pregnancy. They don't give you a risk for one specific twin or the other specific twin. So if you did have a high risk result, um, you wouldn't know whether that was the vanished or demise twin or whether it was the ongoing pregnancy. So in those cases, um, a different form of um, screening or testing is recommended. And Dr. Firoz from Mumbai would like to know, in case of low fetal fraction, does repeat sampling help? If yes, what should be the time gap for repeat sampling? Okay, so um, in cases of low fetal fraction, um, it is possible to offer a repeat sample. Um, and in fact, uh, with uh, I, can, I can talk specifically about the, the panorama test because that's the one that, um, that I'm most familiar with. Um, if you have a low or no result because of low fetal fraction, then there is actually a chart um, that is provided which helps you to work out the chance of success on a redraw. Um, so over 60% of women will get a result on the second sampling. Um, if the woman is heavier, then that, may, that chance may be slightly lower. And if the original fetal fraction was very low, then that chance may be lower. And so the table helps you to look at, based on the weight of the, the lady and of the original fetal fraction result that she had, what are the chances of success on a redraw? The other factor to consider, of course, is that in that low fetal fraction group, um, there is an increased risk of aneuploidy. So depending on the stage of the pregnancy, um, that may affect whether or not uh, you want to instead consider offering diagnostic testing and also your ultrasound findings as well um, may affect what you do. In terms of um, the time gap for repeat sampling, um, we actually did a study recently which looked at um, the time gap and the chance of success. And 
around eight days um, seems to be, uh, for, based on that study, the ideal time. Um, it didn't help to wait longer than that. And it, um, the sort of maximum time was around that kind of level. But remember that, um, that the fetal fraction really can vary from day to day for an individual person. So there isn't a kind of specific time that you have to wait, but that eight day gap seemed to be the, give the best results. Okay. Uh, now a couple of questions for Dr. Priya Kadam. Uh, Dr. Hema from Mumbai would like to know, ideal time for an IPT in IVF uh, cases for donor and maternal embryos are transferred. In such cases resulting singleton pregnancies, can an IPT be offered? And what will be the protocol for this? Uh, thanks, Joseph. And thank you, Dr. Leonard, uh, for a beautiful uh, talk. Um, we got to know quite a few details about uh, NIPT, particularly about, for fetal fraction uh, measurement and how important it is. So, uh, Joseph, uh, just uh, going to your question, from what I understand, it is, uh, uh, it is an IVF pregnancy with a self egg and a donor egg. So, and after that, there has been only one uh, pregnancy noted throughout. So what is the type of testing which can be done? So what we would recommend is that we would first run it uh, assuming that it is the egg of that woman and uh, that the result will actually indicate whether it was uh, self egg or not because uh, the genetic testing lets us know whether um, it, it was a donor egg. And if it is a donor egg, actually uh, the panorama test has a separate algorithm which can uh, give us a result, but a redraw would be needed. Uh, and also, uh, I wanted to add uh, one thing uh, for the previous, um, uh, previous question. Uh, we do uh, provide the table, like, uh, I mean, Dr. S uh, uh, Leonard did mention in detail uh, for fetal fraction. And there's another point that we consider in India is the 20 week cutoff for MTPs. Uh, so, um, I mean, our recommendation is usually based on these factors, the number of days uh, when we request for a redraw. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lena, would you like to add anything to Dr. Hema's question? Um, no, I think that was, that was great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Priya, another question for you. Uh, this is from Dr. Acharya. Uh, in low resource setting, what is the role of NIPT, which is only a screening mechanism? Should, should multiple modalities of screening be adopted within a single institution ethically? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, in India, we do have uh, these things which we should consider. We do see that different institutes have different risk cutoffs. Uh, and then based on those and several other factors, ultrasound findings, people decide, uh, and also the patient preference, uh, people decide which uh, test would be most appropriate. And uh, as regards the costs, of course, the costs have been coming down since NIPT came into India about uh, 2012. We see that there has been a steady decline with the increase in volume and um, also uh, with the uptake and also the benefit of the test. We see that more and more people are interested in taking the test, mostly because in cases where there is a precious pregnancy and as a step uh, before going in for invasive testing, which carries a risk of miscarriage, a small but significant risk. Okay, uh, so uh, Dr. Leonard, we have a follow on question from Dr. Mala. Uh, so she writes, uh, how long does it take for cell-free DNA of the dem demised twin to clear from the maternal circulation? Um, thank you for that question. So um, it's interesting, actually, that studies now have shown that the DNA from a vanished twin can persist um, even 15 weeks after the demise of the twin. Um, and it's for that reason that uh, we don't recommend doing NIPT if you're aware of a vanished twin in the pregnancy. Um, now, it's sometimes that gets confused with how quickly does uh, DNA from a pregnancy disappear after the birth of a baby, um, and that is very quick. So a selfie DNA will disappear from the maternal circulation um, even within hours after the birth of a baby. Um, but in cases of a fetal demise, um, it's the, the fetal tissue, I, I guess, is still there and still releasing DNA, and that can really go on for quite some time in the pregnancy. Okay. Uh, so I will just
see if there are any more questions from the audience. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, nothing else at the moment. Uh, so yeah, so, uh, so that's about it for this webinar. And uh, if you have any more additional questions, you can always write into us at diagnostics at medgenome.com or call us on the toll free number 1-800-103-3691 or visit our website medgenome.com uh, to get more information on the uh, you know, our tests and our capabilities. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Samantha Leonard for taking time off uh, to talk, give us this uh, important talk on uh, fetal fraction. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Priya Kadam for addressing the questions uh, that were put forth by the audience. And uh, just another reminder to the audience that uh, we will be sending out a recording of this uh, webinar if you registered with us. And uh, so this should reach your inbox sometime next week. And uh, we also have uh, links to our other webinars, our earlier webinars on, the, on our website. And the link that we send out to you should guide you to, to that, uh, those webinars as well. And, uh, you know, uh, so again, thank you to the audience for taking time off and registering and attending this webinar. And we will be having more such webinars in the future. And, uh, you know, uh, so thank you again for your time and your patience. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lennon.